So let us begin with prayer. Father God, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for your spirit who fills us. Thank you for the cross, Lord. That in the cross of Christ, who he gave his life, you gave your life, Lord, Lord Jesus, that we might live. And we need you. We need you every moment. Come teach us your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in his uh, book, The Sentient Machine, Amir Hussein writes this. He says, today I might find myself drawn to the important observation that the universe around us is clearly a consequence of computation. A seed, for example, encodes the inform information necessary to produce a tree. With DNA as a software and cells and protein as the hardware, the biological process is a computational one. We find these types of algorithmic outcomes everywhere we look in the universe. Patterns like the Fibonacci sequence, for example, unlock designs across our cosmos. Everything from flower petals to the curving shells of a mollusk, the spiral galaxies to hurricanes adheres to this mathematical formula. Is this by chance? There seems to be a mathematical seed at the heart of the cosmos that through the power of computation has been magnified into the universe as we know it, just as a tree is magnified seed. At some point in my early adolescence, he continues to write, I tried to imagine a future where all of science fused together, all the deductions completed, and all the building blocks of science synthesized into a great pyramid of knowledge. At the very top of this pyramid, however, realized that I was still missing a block that tied it all together. That block is the ultimate question. What is this all for? He then concludes with a chilling realization that even with all of our advancement, we still don't know the purpose for our existence, he writes. We don't? Maybe you haven't read the right book. What is at the top of this pyramid of knowledge that Amir has constructed in his mind is God. It is the person of God. When you realize the God who created you, then you begin to understand who you are and the purpose you've been given. You begin with God. God is the creator. What Amir realized was that was is so obvious. The complexity, the genius, and the amazing artistry of God's grand design. And you see it in his creation. You see the brilliance of God. You see his wisdom breaking through. You see his heart revealed. You sense his grace. All that he has done to make himself known, he has done that. And he desires for you to know him. God created you for himself. God has created us to be in relationship with us. God with us is actually his passion and heart. God's passionate heart is God with us. It always has been. He desires to live among us. He desires to be in the midst of his people. Yet as he lives in our midst, he really desires that we reflect his being as he lives among us. That we would reflect him. We would reflect his character and his heart. He wants to shine through us, all of himself, so that all who see us will actually see him in us. It is his will in us. It is his people in his, in his church to bring a peace that is unimaginable to what humanity could ever know. It is a calm that he can only provide. As a, he is the provider, he is the sustainer, he is the healer, and he is our Lord. In Psalm 46, we read this. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. As people of Israel heard this psalm, they recognized their history was rooted in the acts of God. They existed because God acted. And God loved them, and God moved. He called Israel into existence. He created them for his own people. He subdued the nations that came against his people. He led them. He watched over them, and he loved them. He protected them and sustained them. He is Lord forever. Consequently, as the nation exalts God, it's interesting as you read this psalm, as they exalt God, the more the nation exalts God, the less there is war. And the weapons of war just go away. They start to fall apart. Because God is exalted. Because his character is bleeding through the nation. In fact, as God is exalted throughout the world, his peace will grow. 
Weapons are removed. Hope is realized. This is the God who saved us. This is the plan he has. He is the only solution for the peace that we desire. Our future hope rests in God, not in us. It rests in God's character and will. It is our desire to exalt God. And as we exalt our Lord, his peace spreads. Let us be spreaders of peace and exalt our God. Let us exalt him in all that we do. Let us exalt him in all that we think and speak. So I challenge us today, exalt God. Exalt God in all that you do. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus, when he was teaching the Lord's Prayer to his disciples, he says, pray with these words, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he said that in English. No, he didn't. And the first thing when he was teaching the disciples to pray, when he was teaching them to pray, is to recognize that God is holy. Recognize God is holy. His name is holy. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be feared and worshipped. This acknowledgement of God puts all the pieces in the right place. This teaches us how to pray when you exalt God as holy. God, you are holy. When you recognize he is holy, you put all the things there together and it makes sense. God, you are holy. Your name is holy. You know, it's interesting when you do apologetics, like when you the the the, um, the proofs of God, you know. Let's define God. Let us prove God. It's interesting how holiness never comes up in that discussion, you know. We start with God is holy. Our God is holy. You know, you acknowledge who he is. You establish and build your life around the truth that God is God. He is Lord. He is creator. He's sustainer. He's provider. He's our savior, sanctifier, healer, and coming king. As you humble yourself and fall before the majesty of the Almighty, you recognize then who you are. When you recognize, oh, this is who I am, when you recognize who God is first. And then you recognize who the enemy is and that he's defeated. He's already lost. As you acknowledge the sovereignty of God, you walk in truth, and the lifestyle you're called to live becomes clear and obvious. You see many times we ask God, what is the role in my life? You begin to answer that question by declaring, acknowledging, and understanding who God is. You answer this question by living a lifestyle. If I as I live the Christ life, the understanding of what I am to do will become clear. As you live the Christ life, a calling will emerge in your heart and your life. A passion begins to grow. A servant heart will begin to develop. The key purpose is to live each day in worship and in loving God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. The calling, purpose, and passion we all share comes from our life of obedience to Christ, which produces love. And the calling that we're called to live is really a calling to love. And it's going to ask the question, how are you going to love? That's really what the gifts of the Spirit are. How are you going to love? How will you love? In what manner will you serve? What will you do to demonstrate Christ is Lord and God is sovereign? Those who live under the knowledge of God's sovereignty will pursue the heart of God. They will use their God-given talents, maybe through worship, through singing, playing an instrument. Others will use their talents to build a home, preach the gospel, pray for the sick, sit with the dying, comfort the brokenhearted, strengthen the feeble, teach the children, hold the babies, lift up the discouraged, feed the hungry, visit the prisoner, and clothe the naked. A calling will emerge. How will you love? A person under the lordship of Christ will see the hurting, Hear the heart cry of the desperate and sense the pain of the broken and bring a heal, the, the healing touch of Christ through the love that that person has been given. The pouring out of God's grace is abundant. The more we live in the life of Christ, the more opportunity people in our community will have in receiving him and knowing him. So be bold in your love because it will come through and his goodness will prevail. You know, I imagine, you know, as we come to Colossians 3 here, as we've been looking at the book for, as we've been studying the Colossians, I imagine my own thing that Epaphras took a trip to see Paul in the city of Rome. You know, uh, Epaphras was the church planter who planted the church. Um, And there was other leaders there. And Paul had taught and discipled Epaphras. Epaphras, as he's leading and pastoring this church, has been struggling 
uh, because these teachers have come in and they were rather intimidating and aggressive. And I imagine there was probably a power struggle as these teachers intimidated Epaphras and Epaphras really had no way or understanding how to answer these teachers. So he took a trip and says, I need to talk to Paul. I need to hear what he has to say. And, and so Paul, he, he went and visited him. And Paul taught him and wrote this letter, and he, maybe Ephesians as well. And he, and he said, take this back and read it to the people. Get your eyes back on Jesus. If you could put that in Colossians, like the theme of Colossians, or what's Colossians about? Get your eyes back on Jesus. Focus on the cross. Focus on the empty grave and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Don't let the teachers make Christ inadequate in your eyes. Exalt Christ, for he is your Lord. The same is true for us who live in this evil age and today's culture of unbelief. Don't let this evil age, the teachers of our culture, distract you from Christ and make Christ inadequate in your eyes. Don't let it happen. Get your eyes back on Jesus. You know, Paul had to correct the poor thinking and the poor teaching from religious leaders bent on lifting themselves up and not God. Today we have to beware of the false teaching that is coming from our culture, our politics, and our academies. It is important that we recognize the truthfulness of God's character, His love, and His word. It is critical we stay rooted in Christ as we do not seek to exalt, as we do not seek to exalt ourselves, but to seek to exalt God in all that we do. In this letter, Paul had been showing the beauty of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. He just keeps going back to Christ. Look at who He is. So you have to stay focused. Every day you will battle the idea and the teaching that Christ is not sufficient. It will come up every day. Christ is not sufficient. And to stay on the front lines in defeating this false teaching, you must acknowledge who God is. God, you're holy. And submit to the Lordship of Christ and seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. So exalt God. Number one, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus. Let's take a look at verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. You know, according to the Science of People website, which I don't read much, there's an article called Fashion Psychology. And, and, and so this article will talk about clothing, and this website will say, Wish you knew how to pick the perfect outfit for every situation? Wish no more. In this post, I'm going to show you how to choose clothes that make you feel confident, bold, and ready for anything. You are what you wear. The type of clothes you wear and the kinds of a- accessories you use to either jazz them up or tone them down says a lot about who you are, where you're from what you do, and how you feel about yourself and others. In fact, dress scholars Mary Ellen Roach and Joan Eicher, I didn't know they were dress scholars, find that dress is one of the main ways we send social signals because of what we wear shows our identity. What you wear or dress, as Roach and Eicher define it, sends nonverbal cues to other people. and, And so our clothing can show how much power we you wield, how much influence you have, how smart you are, how much you earn. I didn't know that. Well, another Google website said clothes being part of today's fashion and trend can tell us a great deal about a person's background, social status, aesthetic taste, mood, and even climate con- about climate conditions. They also show whether one is bereaved or not. I didn't know that. You know, for me, I notice that people wear clothes, and that's about it. That ends right there. People wear clothes, and okay. <laughs> And there's only like one green and one red and one yellow for me. You know, that's a red shirt. <laughs> no, there's all these other pa- Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I just know, you know people wear clothes. <laughs> if it's something that may stand out, like if I'm in a room with a bunch of people wearing T-shirts and shorts and someone comes in with a suit and dress, that'll go, whoa, I'll notice that. That'll stand out. But, you know, the perfect outfit is not the clothes we wear, but the life we live. The perfect outfit is the life of Christ. When you get up in the morning, put on Christ. That's what he says there. Put then on, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Put on Christ. 
Clothe yourselves in the beauty of Christ's character in his life. When talking about clothing and the identity it creates, the identity, the identity we want to exude is Christ. And exalt him. When you put on Christ, it will tell the world who Christ is. We will boast in Christ. We'll boast about Christ. And we will exalt Christ. Number one, your identity is wrapped up in Christ. Take a look at, um, in verse 3 of chapter 3. He says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It is hidden. It is wrapped up. Your life is wrapped up in Christ. Who you are is Christ. Together and collectively, as a people of God, we live the Christ life. We are revealing the person and character of Christ. Look at who you are because of Christ. First, you are God's chosen ones. Notice here, put that on. As God's chosen ones, that's who we are. As God's chosen ones, you are a chosen one. You are chosen. God saw you. He loved you. He chose you. He picked you out of the crowd, and he saved you. When you think of chosen, that is his love language to you. I chose you. I picked you. That is his love expressed to you. He loves you. You are chosen. It's also another way of saying that you're holy. Chosen means you're holy. Look at the next word. God's chosen one. Holy. You belong to him. Holiness means you recognize you belong to him and simply that you gaze into the heart of Christ. You seek his word and his will. You listen to him alone. Since you are holy, you are loved. The last word used here is beloved. You are graced with his love. You're showered upon by his love. You are lavished upon. He has lavished upon you his mercy, his grace, his goodness. You are beloved. You are beloved. Your identity here is chosen by God, holy and beloved. Every day you can wake up and tell yourself and live in the reality of who you are in God. I am chosen. I am holy. I'm beloved. I am holy. I'm chosen. I'm beloved. That's the amazing truth of what this word is telling us if you are in Christ, as you walk in who you are. That's who you are. That's who I am. And and no one in this world can take that away. That's who, as you give your life to Christ, I am chosen, I'm holy, I'm beloved. Your identity does it tell us uh, just all who see you and who you are, but what you do. As you put on Christ, look at what you're putting on. You're clothed with a compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. This is similar to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. What you see here is God's character flowing through you. It is his compassion, his kindness, his humility, his meekness, and his patience. Compassion, what is that? It is that deep, and it's deep and has depth. It's it, the very, there's no superficiality with compassion. It is deep. Compa- compassion cares, and it's real. Compassion is a way of seeing the hurt and calling, and a calling to bring healing to the hurt. Kindness is going that extra mile, turning the other cheek, lifting up those who have fallen down, even those that may hate you. Kindness is that fairness of God where he shines the sun on the righteous and the unrighteous. Kindness seeks to give others the opportunity to find Christ. Humility is submitting unto God, knowing he is God, boasting in his strength. Meekness is strength under authority, under God's authority. It recognizes that he's in control. And that he's sovereign. Patience is that waiting for God and his goodness. Knowing that his goodness will prevail as we are faithful in obedience to him. His goodness will prevail. Patience is endurance. Not willing to give up. Wrapped up with patience is faithfulness. I am faithful to God. I am faithful to him. This becomes your identity. As we put on the character of Christ. This becomes your identity. This is who you are in Christ. You carry the life of Christ. You live it out. You express the character of God, and you reveal the majesty of his grace and holiness. Your life is wrapped up in Christ, so exalt God by wearing the garment of Christ. Secondly, seek reconciliation. Reconcile. It is a calling to forgive. Notice what he says here, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. It is a calling to forgive. It's a calling to mend what is fixed and broken, the Christ life. God is primarily a healer, a mender, a fixer, a bender together of what has been torn apart. The relationship God created us to have with him has been broken through sin. 
There's a broken relationship with us and God because of sin. We are alienated from God. We are hostile to God. And yet God loves us deeply. So he fixed the problem. He removed the sin. He forgave the sin. He, the, he has removed the alienation and the hostility. He has forgiven us all of our sins. Christ did this for you and me. He died taking away our sins. He arose conquering death. Sin no longer is our master. God forgave us. You know, in the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, Jesus said a king wanted to reconcile his accounts of money he has given out, and he needed it back. Well, one slave, this is so interesting, one slave was given 10,000 talents of gold. Now, that is an exaggerated amount of money, okay? 10,000 talents of gold, all right? Uh, The King Solomon actually would receive about 700 talents a year of gold. One talent was equivalent to 20 plus years of wages, okay? The amount was approximately $6 billion. Now, if a king gave me $6 billion, I'd be, I'm out. I mean, I'm no longer a slave. <laughs> I'm out of here. In fact, maybe I'd hire an army to go destroy that king. <laughs> I mean, then I'm no longer a slave. It's, it's just an interesting thing. $6 billion. I mean, you could do whatever you want, right? And how did you miss, leave it? What did you do with it? Because the guy doesn't have it anymore. How do you... <laughs> <laughs> what did you do with all the, how did you squander six billion dollars? <laughs> but the point of the parable is not the fact that he received six billion dollars and lost it. The point of the parable is that this is how much of a debt we have to God. When it comes to sin, we have a debt we cannot pay. It's beyond our means. We do not have the time or the ability to pay back the debt of sin. It is out of reach. With a debt this large, you would have to file for bankruptcy. That is what we are, bankrupt. Jesus then said to the said that the king forgave him all of the debt. Can you imagine that? He said, "Well, I just forgive you. It's all gone." And then the guy turns around and some guy owes him $100, and he says, "No, you pay that right now." He wouldn't even forgive him. With $100. What others have done to us is small potatoes compared to what God has, what we have done to God. And so we forgive. That is the point of the parable. Jesus at the end of the parable said in 1835 of Matthew, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. After the teaching of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said the same thing. For if you forgive others in their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There's a reason he says this. As Christ is living his life in you, you embody his full character. And his full character is one of forgiveness. Look at what Paul wrote in Ephesians. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving Forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. You bear with one another. Forgive one another. Don't carry a grudge. Where are you weighed? When you carry a grudge, you're weighed down and burdened and embittered by that grudge. Let Christ take that away. Let him carry it. He died on the cross so he can carry it. Maybe you have to talk to someone to get that bag of job. Then let's do it. As Christ lives in you, a forgiving heart begins to develop and a love begins to grow. The weight of sin becomes weaker. The threats of the past will shrivel up. The hurts of yesterday are crushed. The God of peace surrounds your heart. When you live in the character of God, you will exalt him. So exalt God. Number two, defeat the enemy in God's love. Let's look at verse 14. Above all, Above all these things, above all these, put on love, which binds every everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of God, the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Now, if you were to take 
this verse, particularly verse 16, and you were to go over to Ephesians 5, uh, verse 18 and 19 and 20, you would see that he says, be filled with the Spirit. And here he's telling you, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of Christ dwelling within you richly is the filling of the Holy Spirit. So you see those two connected. Well, walking as Christ walk is the fullest expression of God's love. When Paul said, put on love, he he is saying what he said in 3.12. Binding everything in perfect harmony is the same uh, saying. It binds all the virtues of what we have talked about already. All the words we use, kindness, compassion, humility, patience, all those are virtues of love. When you put on love, you're including all those words. But when you put on love, you're not putting on abstract ideas. You're putting on Christ, a person. You know, as you daily practice living the life of Christ, you will begin to develop the attribute that will be reflected in your life. You will begin to develop habits fueled by the motivation of God's amazing love. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote this, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Imagine that. You have the mind of Christ. Think of that. But we have the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? We'll take a look at Philippians 2 that... Uh, was read earlier to us. Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The mind of Christ leads to the life of Christ. The life of Christ is one of giving ourselves up to God and dying to self living in obedience and serving one another. It's not seeking personal gain or or glory, but seeking to die so that in Christ you can live. Notice that when Christ was here, if he wanted to, he could have ruled the world in two seconds. (laughs) But he came to serve and not be served. The life of Christ is a life of humility, submission to God, subduing and overcoming our deceitful desires. Walking in the truth of love, in, in the truth of love, and loving the truth. Never giving up, but enduring to the end, becoming obedient to the point of death, even if it's death on the cross. The life of Christ will draw you closer to God and away from the distractions of the world. And you will no longer say, Christ is inadequate. You will always say, Christ is sufficient. Number one, the peace of Christ will rule your heart. You know, the amazing truth of what happens as you practice the life of Christ, living out his will and his goodness, is that the peace will settle in your heart. In Psalm 46 that we read earlier, the first part of that psalm says, be still, or the last part of that psalm says, be still and know that I am God. See that peace, that calm? Be still and know that I am God. Earlier you said God is very, our very present help and our refuge. And in verse 1 and 2 and 3, I think of Psalm 46, is even if the whole world were to fall apart, God is still my refuge and strength. Paul talked about the peace of, of God in Philippians, where he says that it surpasses all understanding. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. The peace of God is promised, and this peace is, call, is your calling. What this says is that this peace will produce a thankful heart. Notice that again, the thankful heart. Be, and be thankful, verse, verse 15, the last part of verse 15. But when we speak the peace of God, it's not just how we experience it, but what we give and what we do. We are compelled as followers of Christ to bring this peace to those who are dying, to those who are in hurt, to those who are hurting. We're compelled to bring this peace into the turmoil of those who are steeped in sin and addiction and brokenness and trauma. We see the prisoner and visit him. We see the hungry and feed him. We see the brokenhearted and comfort them. We see the naked and clothe them. We see the hurting and heal them. This is the peace of God ruling in your heart, compelling you unto action. Secondly, the word of God will dwell in your heart. This is the feeling of the Holy Spirit. As you live the Christ life, the word of God will become your agenda, your motivation, your desire, and you will read it, you'll study it, you'll meditate upon it, you'll memorize it, you'll feed off the word. Christ said, man will not live on bread alone, but on the very words of God. God's word is our feast and our sustenance. It is our life. It is life. It will empower you and compel you and push you. You will carry with you the words of God and the, his wisdom and his truth, and you will bring it into a world that is steeped in lies. 
and you'll bring the truth. As the word of God grows within you, a heart full of worship will overcome you. You will... You won't help yourself but to worship God. You will celebrate. You'll worship. You'll sing. You'll rejoice because of Christ. It is interesting. Both the peace of Christ and the word of God develops a thankful heart. Again, a thankful heart. A thankful heart. The joy of the Lord will fill your mind. The peace of Christ will wrap you up like a warm blanket. The love of God will overflow you like a waterfall cascading down upon you, refreshing you from the Strength of the heat. Boy, it's been hot recently. The word of God is Christ. And as you feast on Christ, your mind is renewed. Your mind is strengthened. Your mind is healed. Your hope is secure. And your purpose is real. May you hunger for God's word daily and exalt God. Number three, exalt God in how you live, walk, and speak. Verse 17. This is a verse, a wonderful verse. Repeated in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, by the way. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Why do we do everything unto Christ? Because it brings the peace and the joy and his love into this broken world. You know, Bernie Carbo, he was a former Red Sox, talked about how he had hit a home run in the 1975 World Series, which, of course, they lost. He was a Boston Red Sox, so... He, what's that? Oh. They went eventually, the Red Sox. But. And this is what he said. I stood in the batter's box awaiting the next pitch. It was game six of the World Series. My team, the Boston Red Sox, trailed the Cincinnati Reds by three runs in the eighth inning. And we needed to win this game to stay alive. I was sweating bullets. With two men on base, I could even the score with a single swing. I took a swing and watched as the ball sailed over the center field wall. A home run! What was the one where he was going like this? I can't remember that one. You might imagine that hitting a clutch home run in a crucial World Series contest would be the defining moment of my life. The truth, however, is that I was totally miserable. I was addicted to drugs. I had even used some drugs before the game. I spent the next few years bouncing around from team to team until I finally washed out of the big leagues altogether. I was only 32, and my career was over. Over the next eight years, I continued to use drugs. My wife and I bought a home in Florida, hoping to settle down. But for both of us, the drugs continued to flow. Finally, I told my wife we needed to slow down, but she refused and filed for divorce. I continued using other drugs and abusing alcohol. He continued on by talking about how he had a second marriage, he had a divorce. And then he met a former major leaguer named Dalton Jones who told him about Jesus and explained the difference Jesus could make in his life, as even as troubled as his. And he prayed that day, and he says, I believe Jesus did something when I prayed that day. Even though, after he prayed, he persisted in his drug use to the point of losing all hope. Sitting in his home, he was ready to take his own life. And he felt like he had tried everything and that he was just simply a worthless man. After suffering a pen attack, he was sent to the hospital where he met a retired pastor. The pastor spoke with him about the Bible. He taught him about Jesus and how true healing could happen if he would just trust him, just trust him. So he grew in his understanding of what it meant to live for Christ and every day and to rely on him for forgiveness and strength. Well, in 1994, he had another relapse. And it plunged him into a sea of guilt and despair. And then he met Tammy, the woman who became his wife. And she reminded him about Jesus and the atonement for sins through death on the cross. And he believed once more that, his, that Christ's blood was sufficient to cover all his transgressions and that he could depend on him for the grace that he needed to overcome the struggles of addiction and other habitual sin. Only in Christ. You see how this world will always tell you Christ is inadequate? He's not. So he says, He's been mar- we've been married for 26 years and I've been clean the entire time. I want others to know there's hope. There's a way out of the deadly seduction of abusing drugs. Not only does Jesus Christ offer the way out, but he also offers the way into a life more joyful and abundant than anyone could ever imagine. Truly, our God is an awesome God. This is what God does. This is what God loves to do. And this is what God wants to do through you and me. To bring his word to bring his love, to bring the truth of God into the hearts that are broken and dying and addicted 
and falling apart. I say, God has a way out. God has a way out. He has the strength to give you the way out. This is what God is calling us to do, to bring this message, to live this life, to transform these people in this world, in this town. Because this is what God does. I want to I want to honor God in all that I do. I want to exalt him in everything that I say. I want to give thanks to God the Father through Christ. I want God exalted in my life. Because I know when that happens, people's lives have an opportunity to be changed. Won't you join me? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are our God who has never left us nor forsaken us. That your grace is sufficient. Your presence is sufficient. We need you, Lord. As we live in this evil age, with all of the addictions, with all of the sin, with all of the brokenness, with all of the hurting, we know that you can heal, bless, save, forgive, and overcome. And so we ask, Lord, use us.